Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual Agile Shift session. Before we start, please take note of the question mark icon in the upper right corner of the presentation screen. Clicking that icon will open the question and answers feature, which allows you to send questions to be delivered to our presenter at the appropriate time. We are excited to present Jimmy Strube, Agile coach for Shell, and he will be presenting Extreme Situations Require Extreme Agility. Thanks, Will. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is uh, Jimmy Strube, and uh, just a little bit about me. I, um, I've been consulting for over 20 plus years, and I've uh, been in the Agile space since around 2005, and then got a couple of certifications and joined Shell in 2010, back when they were doing some of their earliest uh, adoptions of Scrum and Agile ways of working and then got a few other cert, uh, certifications and, and scaling. And I live with my, my wife and my, my two sons, uh, 11 and six out in, in Fulcher. And I've been in kind of a fanboy of improving for a while. I know a bunch of improvers and, and uh, just a, it's been a, a, a great company in my experience and, and really want to thank improving for uh, you know, having the Agile shift and uh, inviting me to, to speak. So thank you, uh, Improving, and uh, thank you, Will, for, for producing today. And thank you, attendees, for, for joining us today. I hope you enjoy, um, enjoy that talk. And um, if you want to ask questions along the way, just uh, remember to use that question mark icon up in the top there, and uh, we'll get to those at the end. You can reach me at uh, j.strube at shell.com or on LinkedIn at, uh, at the address there on the screen. So let's imagine, if you will, um, that maybe you've been uh, employing some agile ways of working for a while. Maybe you've been doing uh, some Scrum. Maybe you've been doing some, some Kanban and uh, the teams are starting to get it. You know, things are uh, things are moving in the right direction. Maybe you've got uh, you know a pretty good scrum master. Uh, POs are starting to understand uh, their role. Uh, maybe the team is moving up the curve on forming, storming, norming, performing. Uh, things are looking good, right? Things are uh, things are hopeful. Things are bright, and you kind of see people might be beginning to live the values, right? They're living the principles from the Agile Manifesto. And, uh, you know, you might have some grassroots movements where uh, teams are showing uh, some success with Agile ways of working, and it's caught on with some leaders, and, uh, you know, maybe the teams will walk the walk, and, uh, you know, the leaders will, um, uh, walk to walk and talk to talk to, or at least uh, at least uh, you know, agile's on uh, the lips of everyone in the organization, and and things are going good. And you're even maybe focusing on being agile more than actually doing agile. It's kind of truly an agile paradise. But then one day disaster hits, right? We've got the coronavirus, or you know, it might be a flood or a fire or a hurricane, like we get here in Houston sometimes. And it makes it seem like the world has just come to an end, or it, at least work has has slowed down a lot or very nearly stopped. And folks need to uh, start working remotely. And you see things like maybe their maybe their velocity goes down, or maybe they're getting less results. And uh, maybe even worse, uh, some quality goes down. Maybe they skip a few steps here and there, and there in the processes that they've. Um, uh, that have already matured, maybe they've uh, working in this new way uh, is it's, it's so volatile that that maybe some of the quality goes down. Then so then it's time for action, right? So we get uh, we get a bunch of folks come in there and they and there's this belief that if you're in this uh, kind of crisis mode, that maybe the best approach is just to put the most senior person in charge and then they'll be giving orders and then everyone else needs to just follow those orders. So we end up falling up back into our old habits and you get kind of these 
uh, war groups, uh, which is basically a, a bunch of managers that need to come in and they're going to set things right, right? They're going to they're going to fix the whole the whole situation because we're we're in this um, kind of crisis or emergency mode. And you'll you might hear them say things like, yeah, 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 we're agile or we we do scrum. But, you know, this is this is a troublesome time, right? We're, we're in an emergency and let's leave this agile stuff for when it's calmer or when in they think agile might be uh, a luxury, right? That you that you uh, that they don't they can't afford right now in these trying times. So then these managers do what managers do and they they give big speeches about the importance of the situation and how you know it's all hands on deck and it, it's every it's time for everyone just to push harder just work harder and uh, you know we're going to solve this we're going to get through this if we just if we just work harder. So you get things like micromanagement hell it starts to set in and there's this huge push for for delivery and you might be asked to work overtime you might be asked to work nights and weekends and you get these uh, war room meetings that are every few hours that you have to join that are a waste of time and uh, it's just a nightmare and the result is that um, deadlines are still not being met and uh, there's a lot of compromises that are being made and, and maybe not even much value is being delivered. Uh, it, lower quality too could, could result. You might end up with a huge pile of technical debt that's, that's generated. Uh, then you get just a lot of uh, unhappy, disappointed people uh, that are delivering bad results. So you're in a bad situation. Um, and then most likely nobody's going to believe anymore in these empty words about values and principles. You had your chance, right? So what did we do wrong? And, and what's the solution? It might seem counterintuitive, but uh, destroying agility in these extreme situations is nonsense. Extreme situations require extreme agility. You depend on your teams and you need flexibility and adaptiveness and innovation. And, and we're still trying to solve complex problems. That hasn't changed. So we need to have adaptive, creative thinking people uh, to come up with innovative ideas and approaches to these solutions so we can achieve more with less. Giving orders is the worst thing you, that you can do. At, the, at a time like this. You still have a lot of very difficult work. You have to make sure that people don't panic. They have to act in a united way and they still need to be extremely efficient. Uh, so we're in a, a, a world where VUCA is at an all time high. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Uh, but luckily Agile and uh, Scrum Give us all the tools that we'll need to handle anything that COVID-19 can throw at us. So teams and people should operate with high synergy uh, by talking and sharing and helping each other. Uh, and all of this is still possible. Uh, the solution is simple. It's not that hard. I'm going to share five uh, beliefs uh, which you should hold in order to survive these trying times. We'll talk about extreme trust, extreme transparency, extreme vision, extreme servant leadership, and extreme value delivery. So extreme trust. Um, above all, don't ask for any kind of justification for the work. Uh, forget about timesheets and things like that. You depend on your people. If they want to trick you, then no timesheet is going to stop them. Uh, be human, show trust and vulnerability, and that can win the day. Uh, you're going to need to give them freedom to experiment, even to do some crazy stuff, uh, and to try whatever's needed. So as a leader, tell them, you know, maybe you don't have the solution, but you can give them support, you can give them space, you can give them resources, you can give them safety. Show them that you trust and believe in in what they do. That's the best that you that's that you can do. They're the subject matter experts, right? You we hire intelligent, smart people and we should trust them 
to do the work. And I think that um, the trust comes through the, the scrum values. Uh, very easily you've got the um, uh, focus and openness and commitment and courage and respect, and those all lead to trust. And if you hold those values true, in, even in trying times, uh, then that trust will come and it'll help build the trust. And what, something else that you can do to help build trust right away is deliver value, right? The business will trust the teams uh, when they're delivering value. And the best way to deliver that value quickly is through uh, these agile ways of working. Next, we'll talk about extreme transparency. So share with the team everything you know, right? Tell them always over communicate tell them everything uh new that you've heard or understood at the first possible moment share what you plan to do share what your concerns are share what your fears are uh share what failure failures you've made um good news and bad news is information that we can just use to get better people need to know the truth uh don't beat around the bush this is where you have to kill politics it's you can't have it in these extreme situations. You have to have extreme transparency, which is the uh, antithesis of policy, politics. So everyone that, um, the person who writes the check can see all the way to the people that are doing work. And it's, it's very clear what's being done um, to everyone involved. There's lots of ways to do this, uh, you know, usually through uh, the backlog and some of the events that are, that are built into to Scrum with uh, your feedback loops and your reviews and retrospectives, but uh, open, honest communication and that ability to, to give and receive feedback is uh, crucial at times like this. And extreme vision. Uh, additionally, you're going to need to be explicitly clear about everything which will or might or might not happen. Uh, you got you have to describe all of the needed results and what will happen if you don't achieve those results. You need to draw the full picture. Uh, do it even more that's, than what's needed. Uh, do it so they can visualize it, so they can feel it, so they can understand it. Everybody has to be bought in and understand where it is that we're going and have that kind of point on the horizon that we're trying to reach. Uh, if you're just, you know, barking orders, you're in a command and control mode and you're uh, you're just task mastering uh, folks and giving them work to do, trying to keep people busy, uh, then you're never going to reach that vision. You're never going to reach that end goal. You're going to um, uh, just languish in task master world. And then extreme servant leadership. If you are a leader, um, make the team the boss and you become the servant. Ask for everything that they need you to do so that they can focus on the problem and resolve it. Uh, then serve and do everything that they ask for and do it immediately, right? You have to get in this mode where um, it's like, what, what do you need? What do you need? What can I do? What can I help you with? What do you need? What are your blockers? What can I help you with? And so uh, those almost in a, uh, be a pest about how you can uh, serve the team. The team is the boss. They're the ones that are, that are doing the work and they're the, they're the ones that are uh, delivering the value and you're there to support them. And extreme value delivery. So look, Look at every bit of work from the perspective of the customer. Ask yourself, is this valuable to the customer? If it's not valuable, don't do it. Why are you even doing it? Uh, focus on the highest value things first. Start or continue to have discussions with the team about value. Like, what is it? Who creates it? How is it measured? Uh, you can usually get to value quicker than you think. Focus on simplicity and how you can do more with less. Never sacrifice your team's agility. It can save you. Dealing with extreme difficulties needs extreme creativity. 
focus on boosting agility and creating the perfect environment for fast learning, thinking, and innovation. Uh, this environment you create is going to be full of extreme safety, clear visibility and transparency, empowerment, and all the support in the world from community events like this and your coaches and your scrum masters and product owners in your organization. So that is a brief little pep talk, I hope, uh, for how to handle these trying times that we're in. Uh, are there any questions? Not yet, we don't have any. Okay, I remind everybody that you can use the, uh, the question box and we can um, answer some questions at this point. Does this hit home for people? Do you find yourself in these situations? Has anyone been in situations like these? So Jimmy, I will remind you that there's about a 20 second lag between the video and what we receive from the questions. Uh, so if you had the other stories you wanted to go into, you should you could probably do that now. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back then and we'll go to trust. So there, um, let me tell the story then about extreme trust. There was, uh, this project manager who had been managing projects for probably 20 something plus years. And uh, this was one of the very first scrum projects that I was on. I was at the, uh, the scrum master and they actually started up the project um, as a waterfall project. And then um, some leadership above him said, uh, you know, we heard about this agile stuff. We heard it's pretty good. Why don't you, why don't you switch this over to agile? And they had already gone through the, some of the stage gates and started getting the, the team together. And this guy just did not believe at all that like this was going to be the way to deliver this. And he, he was a um, kind of an opponent to agility at the time. This was back in uh, maybe 2010 or so. And uh, you know, we did some training and tried to help him understand what uh, what it was and how it worked. And we, uh, you know, he he was the kind of project manager that would spend a lot of time in Microsoft Project, and he would build a huge Gantt chart uh, that would fill up a whole wall if you printed it out on a plotter of everything that needed to be done in this project. It was going to be about a five or six year project with about 30, 40 people on it. And <clears throat> he. Uh, he always believed through his whole career that if you had the perfect plan, then you could um, execute it perfectly and everything would, uh, uh, you know, you'd have a success. And he had built a career on that and he was pretty successful, uh, but he was a, the kind of guy that um, uh, you probably wouldn't want as your project manager. He's a pretty rough, rough guy. And he, it, it was a lot of screaming and yelling when things didn't follow the plan in order to get people try to get people on track. And after, uh, but he he did uh, since actually since his leaders told him that this should be an agile project, he was going to uh, to give it a shot and see how it worked. And after about three sprints, he uh, we saw that what uh, what we originally thought the scope of the project to be was completely different than what it, what it was what it should have been so uh, originally the business had requested kind of a, a redesign of uh, of an existing application and it ended up being much 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 bigger than that and so within about three sprints uh, he had all of the data that he needed in order to go back and get some more funding for uh, for the project to uh, to get it back on track and he he actually pulled me aside after I think in sprint four and and this was like a 60 sprint uh, sprint, sprint project uh, month long sprints and he he pulled me aside and he he said man I want to apologize to you because I didn't think that this that any of this would work and you guys really showed me that uh, the the way that I could 
uh, pivot and change direction and course correct along the way. And uh, he became one of the champions for Agile Ways of Working um, in that company uh, after that. He, and for the rest of his career, he's been doing uh, only Agile projects. He'll only work in that way now. And so he's, he's a, he turned from a skeptic to a champion just by showing him uh, in a few sprints that you can um, that responding to change over following a plan is uh, is better and uh, he was he, he he was like i'm living a lie right my whole life as a project manager but but after that he he was he was glad that he had found agile and he had embraced those ways of working and really helped build uh, trust with uh between uh he and i and the team and the business and the team and and everybody but uh, it was it was a, a rough time there for for a little while having the, the this senior project manager uh thinking that the way that you're working is completely wrong but it, it didn't take very long to, to show him the, the uh show him the ropes and he under he understood after that and got it okay maybe i can tell something about uh transparency too <sighs> there was um there was another time at uh, another company, and you you might have been in this situation too, where you uh, you kind of want to sweep some things under the rug sometimes. Like you don't want everybody to know everything that's going on, and so uh, you might cut some corners here and there, and you might um, uh, you know, sure, it's ready to go, it's ready to to deploy. We can get it out there, and then you know you'll deploy it and it'll break and then you got to spend some more time trying to fix it and uh, then everybody's up all night after the deployment trying to fix some things in production and uh, it's it's just a mess and this is for me this is kind of a personal journey of, of transparency where uh, I've always felt like honesty is the best policy but uh, transparency kind of goes beyond honesty it's like extreme honesty uh, to everybody all the time and people uh, people actually appreciate that even even bosses even hard bosses difficult bosses and leadership they would rather know bad news early than uh than later right so it all of all of the data that we collect whenever we're building something is just information that we can use to get better later and you can't uh act on that information if you're not transparent about it and so if you can embrace these Kind of notions of fail fast or learn fast and uh, you know it's okay to be not perfect right we're all human and we make mistakes and we 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 do things wrong sometimes and uh but we, if you can get back up on that horse and you can um uh you know be honest and be transparent with uh with your team and your leaders and uh with everyone then I, I think you're going to have that. You're going to find that that's uh, that is the best policy. Honesty is the best policy. And extreme honesty or transparency is is key to uh, being able to make decisions for the future and how to get better. And let me tell one about vision. So yeah, you maybe have been on a project like this where the Nobody knows what you're what you were working on, especially on a really big project. If you have lots of teams and someone has already done all the planning up front, like they 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 said, OK, this team's doing this and these people are doing this and they, they cut it down into tiny little bite sized tasks and everybody uh, has work to do. Right. But no one is really all on board on that extreme vision. Um, I was. I, working with the company that built uh, healthcare.gov uh, a few years ago, uh, or part of it, right? There were like 16 or 20 different contracting companies on there, and there was no like organized leading vision to all of that. And uh, it fell over when it launched the first time. And uh, I mean, they fixed it after, and there were some congr congressional hearings and all that uh, after a while, but it, it was because I think that there was not a a clear vision for all of these contracting companies to uh, to follow, and especially uh, even more so for the teams. And uh, if you just have these tasks and a little bit of, of uh, uh, 
work that you're that you're supposed to do and you have blinders on and you can't see what everybody else is doing and you don't have any idea what the vision is it's just you know go do this task then um, you're set up for failure you're not going to be able to succeed so having this ex this thought of extreme vision is is very crucial because uh, it's how you get everybody on board it's how you uh, everyone can steer their individual ship toward that star and with the lack of uh, you know a captain or some leadership uh, in front of them all the time uh, so if you have if you have that vision and you uh, you can steer toward that uh, easily if uh, if it's communicated and that takes a really strong uh, product owner to be able to uh, not only hold that vision, but then communicate it to everybody all the time. And I've seen things, you know, I've, we've gone through vision writing workshops and, uh, you know, we do vision boards and vision canvases and all different vision type visioning tools. But you still, uh, the product owner usually still has to be the salesperson for that vision and uh, talk about it all the time, right? And everybody gets kind of their elevator speech of what's the vision of the work that we're doing. And some teams go as far as when they write their concise vision statement that they recited at the beginning of all of their meetings, just like it's the Pledge of Allegiance or, or something that that's the vision. So it, you know, it, it hasn't changed. We're all steering in the right direction and we're all moving uh, toward that, that point on the horizon. And then extreme servant leadership. Uh, this one is uh, also pretty personal to me because it's like, um, it's like being a, a father. So I'm, I, you know, I have two two boys, eleven and six, and uh, I think of servant leadership as as uh, being like a dad to them, right? You can't always uh, tie their shoes, right? You can't always uh, ride, run beside them on the bike when they're they're um, they're learning how to ride their bikes. So you do have to uh, let them fail sometimes, and that's how that's how they learn. And a uh, good servant leader and good coaches and good scrum masters do those kinds of things. But uh, you're, this becomes ingrained into your kind of your, into yourself after you've done it enough to that you're you let go of the reins and you're not a, you're not a boss anymore. And you you you'll realize that uh, command and control uh, just doesn't work. It's not effective. And people uh, you you know they want to have autonomy. They want to be able to learn and grow on their own and. Uh, you can give them some boundaries to work in, uh, but then you give them the freedom and creativity to work within those boundaries. That, I think that's why there's a lot of crossover between uh, like software and um, like music, uh, because you're given kind of these set of rules or guidelines that you have to follow. But within those, you can be you can be creative. But I think being a good servant leader is is allowing that to happen and and setting those boundaries and then uh, doing everything you can to to serve the team and uh, make sure that these are not just hollow empty words these this this is a way of life to be able to uh, lift people up and maximize their potential and then extreme value delivery so this one's last and i think it's the most important because now is the time where everybody's kind of cost cutting and you know, people are getting laid off and furloughed and they're uh, it's it's rough times right and so you have to focus on that value delivery because every single minute that you spend of your company's money is not wasted if it's not pointing toward delivering value so it's very important to understand what it is uh, who creates it how it's measured and where you know where it's coming from and is everything i'm doing creating value and you know we have our leaders speak about that all the time make sure that you're focusing on value delivery but it's uh, you know if you're in a um it's things like if you're in an hour meeting with uh, with 10 people and you waste uh you know a couple of minutes in that meeting you know that's it's multiplied by all the people that are in the meeting so if you can shave just a few minutes off of uh off of some of your some of your meetings that, that have a bunch of people in them then you've saved the company some money and they can work on things like creating value for their customers and it, it's being extreme like that to think about every single penny every every uh every cent of the company's um, money and you know, whenever you're building things too, you don't, you definitely don't want to 
uh, do anything extra. You know, I think we're taught we're taught usually sometimes in in college or in school you're given extra credit for kind of going above and beyond um, uh, the call of duty, but uh, in the real world, that equates to wasted money and time because it's beyond what uh, what the customer wanted for or asked or needed. And so uh, definitely stick to that vision and understand where the value is coming from and then focus on that. OK, those are all my little stories. Do we have any questions now? All right. Yeah, we do have some questions for you, Jimmy. Yep. <clears throat> it's, um, there are several that are very similar uh, so I'll, I'll actually, but there are some minor, or not minor, there are some distinct differences between them. So uh, you may have some things to repeat. What, what should we do with the high management that wants to forget about Agile because of the crisis that's going on right now? Yeah, I knew that that question would come up. What do you want to do if when um, your leaders just want to just want to forget about agility. Uh, I think that it's real important to make sure that you're collecting data on all of the work that you're doing so that you can you can show that to the leaders and say when we work like this, you get these results When you work like this, you get these results. And so uh, it's very clear to to leadership uh, what works better and what doesn't. So uh, obviously keep really good data on uh, you know things whatever your OKRs or KPIs are for your for your work uh, so that you can show show them that and that's that's part of that extreme uh, transparency I think too but uh, what's key is that value delivery right the, you're never going to convince anybody that what you're doing is better if you're not delivering the value so that has to come first and you know focus on things like MVPs and you know getting the thing, uh, cycle times and lead times and getting the stuff out the door into the into the customer's hands as quick as possible to get feedback and um, and then tracking all the data around that too and then you have an argument right then you have uh, you have some evidence for your case that uh, that agile works and um, other ways don't that might help have that open honest transparent conversation talk to the teams, you know, ha uh, have calls with leaders and teams and say, this is this is how we work and uh, this is what's worked for us and this is what doesn't. And similarly, do you have any experiences that you can share when the management is pushing for those deadlines and trying to tough out agility in those extreme times? Yeah, so I think Part of being an agilist, is, your part of your job is to kind of challenge the status quo, and you have to you have to push back sometimes on on leaders if it's if it's possible in your culture where you are uh, to uh, to you know show them that that data and show them uh, what's working and what's not, and you you have to do it through the value delivery. I, I think I, I can't stress that enough that. Uh, if you can sprint a few times and get to some uh, something that's valuable that's in the hands of the customer, then I think that you're going to get a lot more buy-in from um, from folks than than not. Great. And to follow on that, um, so you mentioned the. The, the layoffs and the the hard times that are going on right now and you know leadership they just a lot of them really don't care about the process and they might even forget just forget about velocity capacity and they just want you to deliver mm -hmm. how do you make peace in situations like this uh well you can still deliver right but you uh maybe and, and uh, this this has worked a few times and it, it's always funny when this works to me is um don't call it agile. Don't call don't call it Scrum. Don't call it Kanban. Just call it. You know, it, this is our team's way of working. And some uh, leaders will sometimes put uh, they, there's a bad connotation on agility, and uh, you know they 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 see this as like we talked about. It's it, it's a luxury, right? It's a nice to have, and in, in times where it's calm and we can innovate. Uh, but it's uh, just try calling it something else. I would call, you know, you could just call it uh, uh, continuous improvement. You know, who can argue with continuous improvement? It, it's, it, you're improving continuously. It's hard to argue with it. But if you, if you, uh, you know, if you call it 
uh, agility, then then sometimes uh, some leaders will get a bad taste in their mouth because maybe they've tried this a few times and they they uh, they don't they don't under understand it. So um, yeah, just call it a different name, but do the same stuff. All the same things we talked about. You can call them you can call them continuous improvement. You can call it agile. You can call it productization. You can call it uh, you know product teaming, natural teaming, DevOps, whatever you want to call it. We actually have a comment that is very similar to what you just said. Uh, I believe the reason why most leaders fail is because of their panic and denial to these crisis situations. If we are able to control this panic and fear and figure out solutions peacefully, such as you know, changing what you call it, mm -hmm. um, things may be smoother. You agree with that? Yeah, I do agree with that. It's uh, so that that peaceful resolution, I, I, you know, in you can in, invite them to, uh, to some reviews and retrospectives, and you know those are always transparent and open to everybody anyway. So uh, I, I think that that if you can show what's happening and that you are delivering something, and you know the business is, uh, is happy with it, then uh, then leaders uh, will calm down, right? There, there. But there is definitely that tendency to to panic and fall back into our old habits and old ways of working, but um, you know, have those have those workshops, have those calls, invite those leaders if they're if they're concerned. Then uh, show them, let the team step up and and uh, you know show what they're working for. Yeah, I agree with that. How do you keep the team motivated and focused on the work? Oh gosh, so uh, that's a. Uh, there's as many answers to that as there are people, right? There's people are motivated by different things, and uh, if you are leading a team, uh, you, you should make sure you know what their motivators are. And there's there's a lot of different ways to uh, to look this uh, to figure that out for your team. But uh, there's games and activities and workshops that you can do to uh, for people to understand their own motivations too, and then share those with the rest of the team. And you know, the people are mo motivated by a lot of different things. You know, they could be motivated by status or knowledge or, or um, you know, money or you know, being important or you know, technical mastery or whatever they're they're motivated by. But you can't motivate people if you don't understand what their motivations are. And some people don't know what their own motivations are until they go kind of go through some of these activities. And so, um, there's a great uh, game. Uh, that's called Moving Motivators, and it's a card game with it where it has all of the different uh, uh, um, kind of axes of motiv motivation that uh, that um, people have. And then if you play this game, you can kind of figure out what motivates me as an individual, and then you can see everybody else on the team, what motivates them, and it really helps you understand uh, each other as a team. And then if you're leading the team, uh, you can you can tell oh these people aren't motivated by the same thing I am or are they're not motivated by what I expected them to be motivated by and so um, you once you know what their what their motivations are then you can you know gear toward those if it's something like technical mastery then um, training might be something that they that they want to do or on the job experience or if it's status or something like that then make sure that you're giving them recognition in whatever forms you have in your organization or right? so if it's um, you know, whatever it is, make sure that you're, as a servant leader, that you're you're playing towards those motivations. Yep. Uh, I would like to remind uh, our audience that we do have some time, so if you have questions, go ahead and post them, and we will we will be getting to them. So, <clears throat> you actually, Jimmy, you just spoke about two more things that are brought up so but I'll ask them anyways what are your suggestions for handling the situation when employees are becoming more focused on whether they will have a job after the reorganizations that are announced due to covid rather than on the project delivery yeah so that's that's kind of at the front of everyone's mind is is what's what's the future going to look like what are, what is my job going to look like am I going to even have a job uh, there's probably some folks on this call, on this call that have been laid off too. So, uh, it, what I would say is that um, uh, I keep going back to that that value delivery, and it even if you do lose your job, 
you will be able to show what were you were able to accomplish, right? And you'll be able to, um, in your next job interview, talk about how uh, how you were able to deliver that value. And then uh, if your company is trying to make a list of who they're going to keep and who they're not, they're going to keep the people that are creating value, not the ones that are not. So if you're, if it's okay to focus on that, that value delivery and have that extreme value delivery focus, um, because that could be what saves your job is, is that you're on the team that's delivering more value than, um, you know, other teams or other products in the company. Hang in there. We have another comment. Um, yes, extreme trust is a daily struggle with our team. The product owner uh, who's look tends to be very transparent, while the tech lead tends to want to follow his own path for the developers, non-transparent to the product owner and the scrum master, who is myself. Playing a servant role is like pulling teeth at times. Yep. Um, so I've seen this before too on projects where, uh, uh, first of all, you said tech lead too, so that kind of gives me a, a red flag that you've kind of got a sub boss or somebody on the team that people that people look to. And remember, when we're doing Scrum, we don't have titles on on a team, and so everybody should be at the same level. We're all pulling in the same direction. We're all trying to deliver deliver that together too. So maybe. Uh, Understanding their place on the team um, might help that uh, that tech lead that, that that maybe they're not the ones that are that are um, um, that should be the lead right or if if there even should be a leader because they're the team should be um, self managing and self organizing but they uh, I think that you could point out to like the, these kind of things should be coming out in a in a retrospective type event where the um, the product owner would t tell the team you know, what what they're experiencing, like give them feedback. And the, the best way to give feedback is to say, here's what happened and here's how it affected me, right? Or here's how it affected the, the product. And I, I think just having that, that open, honest uh, conversation and transparency and feedback, um, those feedback loops, especially in like uh, retrospectives, can, um, you know, help everybody uh, on the team, understand where their their weak spots are and how to improve on those. And if you pick, make sure that you're picking a kaizen in your retrospective every time of something that you could improve for next sprint. So if the product owner says, um, you know, by doing this, this is what how you've affected the product or how you've affected me. Uh, you know, what can we do as an experiment to fix this in the next sprint and then work on that as your as your kaizen. But uh, that the cultural aspect of that too is is uh, is strong, right? And there's there's a lot of uh, cultures that we work with that are kind of anti-agile, right? They're they're very uh, like caste system and hierarchical, and you, you know you don't speak out of turn to your seniors and things like that. And so uh, those kind of cultural uh, blockers to agility can uh, really mire a a team down, and I think one of the a good way to get beyond that is to create, uh, have the team create their own culture. So uh, if you if you're working with uh, working agreements, make sure that the team has working agreements. Uh, if they haven't yet, then uh, you know workshop with them and and create those working agreements, and that's going to help the team create their own culture within the team that goes beyond what their um, you know what their maybe their family or their country's uh, culture is too, and so, uh, and, and you don't come to the team with any assumptions or baggage from from previous projects. If you're working on those, uh, if you're creating those working agreements and self organizing and self managing, then that might go a long way toward creating your own culture that trans transcends some of those other cultures outside of the office. Yeah. What are your recommendations about delivering extreme value solutions with extremely limited resources like people, money, time, or even knowledge? Yeah, so it's kind of a, there's a, you have to still focus on value and it, it just be clear with every, this ties in well with transparency too, be clear to everyone how much value you can achieve and by when. So if you have a, 
you know, if you have a nine person team and you, you've got you, your stocked backlog and, you know, you're going to make, you know, X amount of value delivery every, every sprint. And then suddenly you go down to, you know, a three person team, then everybody has to understand, including, you know, the business and all the stakeholders and even the customers that, um, our capacity is, you know, close to a third of what it was. So you can expect a third of the value delivery, but you're still prioritizing your backlog based on value, and you're still delivering the highest value things first. And you're still, um, you're still trying to get the have those small little bits of functionality that you can put into the hands of the customer that they can they can get value from, and that you can. Uh, that you can get feedback on so but be transparent about how much you can get done and you probably need to you know redraw your your um uh, product burn down or something like that where you can say we're all, we're gonna get to we're only gonna get this far by this date or by this date we're only gonna get th this far through our backlog as it is now um, and, ju and just be clear and transparent with all the customers and stakeholders and they can't they can't say in an i mean in an agile world they can't say um you know, give me this uh, this scope by this date for this much money at this quality. I mean, that's that's the triple constraint, and you're setting yourself up for for failure. And um, so the the scope is usually what's variable on agile and scrum projects. So you have to have that uh, negotiation and uh, transparency with with leaders about that. On the there was a comment on the previous question that just thanking you for your input. Okay. You're welcome. If Agile has been abandoned during a crisis, how do you successfully convince management to reconsider Agile afterwards? Ooh, that is a good one. Let's think about the future some more. Um, ah, let's see. If you had uh, abandoned it and you went to this uh, into kind of some old habits of ways of working, I'm assuming that it didn't work very well. Like if quality went down, or you, just, you know you weren't able to deliver some of the, on some of the commitments. And uh, but if it did work, then is that a bad thing? I mean, if you if you if it's working, don't if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? If, if it's uh, if it's if it worked, then uh, maybe keep doing it. But uh, you know you still have to have feedback loops and continuous improvement and. You know, no big upfront planning, and you know, collaborating with the customers, and um, all, all of the all of those things you, you still have to have. Uh, but um, yeah, it kind of goes back to the response about call it something different. You know, maybe you can uh, still do the same. Uh, you can, within whatever constraints you're you're put in uh, from leadership, you can still. Um, have an agile mindset and have agile ways of working within some of those constraints sometimes. So if they say, um, you know, we have to have this this by this date and, and this quality, then um, you can work toward that with agility, but uh, but be transparent about what's actually possible. Don't don't beat around the bush or, or um, you know, cross your fingers and hope for the best. You have to really be uh, clear on what the team is capable of doing and what they can get done by when. Transparency, extreme transparency. You talked about trust with the leader. Can you talk about team trust and how you build that psychological safety within a team? Yeah, psychological safety is very important uh, on the teams. So the, I'll go back to the scrum values again. I think that, uh, um, you know, courage, commitment, um, respect, focus, openness, you have to have uh, all of those and if on your team and as a scrum master you might want to take a step back every once in a while and um, take a look at those values with the team and see which ones maybe you're not putting as much attention on as you need and then you can uh, maybe shift the focus to some of the different uh, to the different scrum values but they're all there in order to create trust in the team and outside the team and, and everywhere, right? So if you're holding those values um, true, then you uh, you should be able to build trust within the team too. And you know it, we're all human. Show those vulnerabilities, show those failures, um, share um, you know share your own failures and, and vulnerabilities, and that helps um, um, you know people see each other as humans instead of just little icons with names on them when we're chatting with each other. 
and uh, it, it helps build those trusts. And I would, I would go back to the working agreements too. I think that uh, if if a, a team is going to self-govern themselves or self self-manage and self-organize themselves, then uh, they're going to have to have trust. And I think that they do that through their working agreements because it's kind of their constitution of how that they write themselves on how they're going to govern them govern themselves. And so if you if you uh, do your working agreements and you can frame them around the values and things like we believe in respect so we will stay home when we're sick or you know we believe in courage so we will tell the product owner when we're going to not complete the sprint uh, and things like that and so if you can frame all of the the statements in the working agreements toward the values then then that's that's worked really well for me and and teams to uh, to build that trust and that culture and all of all of that goes together, right? The trust and the culture and the working agreements and the transparency and all of that uh, are, are tightly linked. But um, yeah, have some workshops with your team around um, their working agreements and uh, how they can best work together. And then uh, make sure that you're encouraging them to police themselves, right? So if they're part of being self-organizing and self-managing is that they are calling each other out on the things that they put in the working agreement. So if they said things like, Hey, look, we said we weren't going to have our phones in here in the meeting room. Um, and you've got because that's that's what we put in our working agreements as something that's going to help us work better. Uh, but you've got your phone in here. Then I think it, that's um, that shows courage, right? By policing yourself. But um, I, I think things like that, those human moments, that's what's going to help build trust in the team. Yep. What's the best way to future proof for the next crisis as you're coming out of the current one. Yeah, so these the the values. I mean, I can't get away from uh, the values. It, it, it you we talk about um, doing agile versus being agile, and uh, you might have heard of like Shu Ha and Re, where you you know you you know the rules and then you can bend the rules and then you can transcend the rules that kind of thing, and and so. I think that if you if you're holding these values true in your heart and your and your actions and your mind, then then uh, it's going to pay off, right? And if you um, if you just read through the values and you say, yeah, okay, that makes sense, I'll work better, uh, then you're just maybe doing agile, right? You've checked the agile checkbox and. Uh, but you're not being agile. You're not. You haven't really lived up to those values. It's like a code. It's like a. It's like a code of how to work and how to how to be a better human. I think if you if you are following those values, so um, print them out real big, put them on the wall, talk to them, talk about them all the time, memorize them. Yeah, it it, it it's all about the agile values. I think. We have a couple more minutes if you still want to get your questions in. When the times, uh, excuse me, when the team's time is fractured by numerous meetings for things such as self-improvement, architecture meetings, research on new efforts, etc., how do you manage time to create blocks of time needed for the team to be able to focus and have better collaboration? Um, ask the team. You know they, they're the ones that that know the best about how they're going to spend their time and so i would i would have a workshop around like let's talk about our meetings and our times and how it's split up in a week and how, how can we improve this maybe you you put them back to back on one day or for for so they can focus the rest of the time and it's not so segmented or fragmented or maybe you can um um, combine some some meetings or you can maybe have smaller touch points or maybe uh, a lot of that stuff should maybe uh, make sure that you're having your daily scrums too because if you, the, the one of the purposes of the daily scrum is to uh, avoid some of these lengthier meetings uh, later that will take up too much time and so if you're sticking to kind of those 15 minute daily scrums then sometimes you don't need these other longer lengthy meetings if you're just staying connected and all working in, in the same direction but if you're, it, it sounds like there's a lot of, of wasted time. Maybe the wrong people are in the meetings. Maybe the meetings are too long. Um, we have this uh, this habit of scheduling meetings for like 
15 or 30 or an hour uh, and people always will fill up that time completely every time with the with the meeting usually and so uh, you know you might want to try some things experiment around you know make a make a 22 minute meeting or you know make a make a if you've got an hour meeting try cutting it in half if you've got 30 minute meetings try it in 15 and and um you know i bet people can adjust i bet they can i bet they can be concise in their thinking and their 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 speaking and their actions on the in some of those meetings to uh, make the best use of that time. That clock is always ticking. Make the best of it. Every minute is a, it, that you you aren't working on value delivery. You're wasting your your company's time and money. This is our last question. Okay. How important? Will the VSM be to attain the valuable deliverable? Yeah, that is a, that's an important activity. Value stream mapping, I'm assuming, what is what you're talking about. That um, you know, we talk about extreme value delivery. First of all, you have to know what what it is, and, and the best way to know what it is is to do a value stream map. And uh, in a place like Shell, if you talk about the value stream map of of finding the oil, extracting the oil you know, transporting it, refining it, you know, transporting it again, selling it. That's a really long value stream. So maybe you can, if your company is, is, um, has a manageable kind of a value stream that you can, that you can, uh, you can map out, then that's going to tell you um, where the value is coming from and where all the waste is in the, in, in the, uh, in the stream to before the value happens. And, uh, when you do that exercise with people, they it, there's usually a lot of eye openers of, about um, you know where the big bottlenecks or where the big waste is in the value stream. If you do that value stream mapping activity, well, thank you all for attending today's session, and Jimmy, thank you for sharing. Thank you, thank everyone else for attending, and and thank you, improving and Will for for. Um, uh, for producing and uh, I'll put my name and contact information back up on there again and I'd love to hear from hear from folks and connect with you so thanks a lot everybody we also value continuous improvement and your feedback so please complete a survey for this session by logging into sketch.com and locating the session and then clicking the feedback survey button the recording of the session will be available tomorrow to view the recording Locate the session from your sketch.com schedule and click the video stream button. We hope you enjoy the rest of the virtual agile shift and have a good day. Bye, thanks.